Hey, Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to have you. So, for those of you listening right now, if you haven't met Greg yet, Greg Cope White is a produced television writer. He also steps in front of the camera and hosts. The Pink Marine, his first book, just came out in November 2015. His writing credits include HBO's Dream On, Norman Lear's The Powers That Be, and 704 Hauser, Fox's Life with Louie, Sony's animated series Jumanji, which is a run of my favorites, I like that one, and Disney's Social Studies. He currently has a sitcom in development with Norman Lear's Act 3. So, Greg, you've had a ton of experience in writing in all different fields. Um, how did you get started with that? Writing, I got started based on a writer's strike in L.A. I had just moved to L.A. from New York, and I was an actor, and a writer's strike hit, and so there were no jobs for anybody. There weren't jobs for writers. There weren't jobs for actors. There were no shows. So I had all this time, and I had a, a stack of scripts that I had used to audition with, and I just was reading the scripts, and I thought, wow, I could just write this. I've got time. There's no auditions. So I, uh, start, I learned the format, which, as you know, in any writing helps. I learned the script format and started writing, and I just fell in love with it and fell in love with that format. And then I got super lucky, and my first job in Hollywood was writing for Norman Lear. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So um, how did your career progress from then? I mean, you got this great gig. You kind of had an easy break, I guess? Well, I had to pay my dues. You know, I didn't get a job hired to write for Norman Lear. I should back that up a little bit. I got a job in his production company, and it was probably six or seven months before I started getting brought in to write on a show. I, wrote, I developed stuff before that for him, and he knew I was a writer from the beginning when he hired me, and then we started, uh, then I got to write on some shows. That progressed when his deal was up. I went on and freelanced at other shows and was on staff at other shows. But he, him and his production company have always been a constant in my life. As a matter of fact, he wrote the foreword to my book. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So, you know, a lot of people say, you know, in Hollywood, it, it's all about connections. You know, how much of your time would you say starting out, did you spend actually writing versus, you know, networking, making connections and, and making things happen? There's times that it's half and half. I wish that the business side of the business didn't have to be handled by the artist. I really wish that I had 100% of my energy to devote towards the creative side because I think that the project, the product would be even that much better. However, it's always been 50-50. Even you know, once you have an agent and, and or a manager and you're on a show, you're still constantly making contacts, working contacts. Every job in Hollywood ends. The Simpsons will end. So all those people that are on all those shows have to look constantly for the next job. Uh, you know, I've been on shows where at our lunch break, the first thing we've all done is run to our offices and called our agent and asked, you know, what's coming up on the horizon? Because you don't know if anything's going to be canceled or what's going to be put forward. There's been shows that have aired in New York and then canceled before they've even had a chance to air in L.A. So you're, you're constantly looking for jobs, and that goes with everybody. That's writers, directors, actors, producers, cameramen, makeup artists. So, you know, my biggest uh, advice and for anybody is be nice. Be nice and use that, that networking that you're going to have to rely on based on your own reputation. Be nice, be a strong, good worker, and the networking is just nonstop. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. So what would you say, you know, has been the best habit or skill that you've learned that's really helped your career? I think writing every day helps and then help other people. A bunch of writers, as soon as I write a script or other people write a script, we send it around to a circle all for free and we all punch up and pitch on ideas. So that happens when you're on a show as well. You know, when you're watching a television show and it says written by Greg Cope White, there were a dozen other people writing that book or writing that sitcom, sort of like a, the book process as well, when you have copy editors and an editor and a publisher that all are polishing and making it better. But that script was initially my first draft, and then it goes to a table of staff writers and producers that you know say, okay, let's make this joke a little bit better, or perhaps let's have the character walk in the room in a different scene first and have a fight or whatever. And you all agree on it. And then you have about a week before the script's actually shot. So typical TV is about a week. You go in with your script, you rehearse and write, 
the actors are rehearsing on stage and you're rewriting in an office, sending new pages down and everybody's cooperating and everybody's going after the, the best script that they can. So I think my, you know, to get back to your question, just stay in touch with as many people in your circle as you can and then keep that circle expanding. Uh, it's a tiny town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. You know, LA's got millions and millions of people, but, um, you know, it is a small world no matter where you live. Yeah, and your reputation does precede you. How you acted on a show, uh, you know, your behavior in the office, what you were like to work with. That's all the stuff that you don't get to, you know, you don't get to hear those conversations. You know, you can't even trust your agent. Your agent has other clients. So if, if he's not keen on you that day, he may pitch a writer that he's more, uh, has more in his favor at that minute. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it amazes me how little we learn these like soft skills of, you know, communication, how you get along with the people in school, because it's, it's absolutely so important in any career, in any field. Yeah, you know, people go, are going back to school, as you know, to get MFAs before they write their books. And I, I wish that there were some more classes offered, uh, whether it's you're going to write for television or magazines or travel or, uh, or a book. I wish there were a little bit more classes offered in schools about the business end. Mm -hmm, definitely. So what are some of the biggest business skills that you learned other than networking like we talked about already? I think, uh, you know, tenacity comes in. You know, this is, a, as you know from writing books, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And to be tenacious, it, thank God I was a U.S. Marine because there's nothing that trains you better to be tenacious than the Marine Corps. You really have to stay focused and stay on track. You're going to get a lot of no's. No matter what you're doing, you're going you're gonna to get a lot of no's. It's super easy to say no, but it's always possible that someone's going to say yes. So just keep after it, keep going, keep making phone calls, keep going in. You know, a lot of people don't know that Sylvester Stallone carried the script of Rocky around town for five years before it found a home. He probably, in a lot of rooms, was talked about like a crazy person. Like, oh, I can't believe that guy's coming back. Stallone's coming back with that same script. And, but for five years, he was relentless. He brought it into every meeting. He kept calling and calling and calling. And you know the result is history. It won Best Picture, and it made a career for him. But it, and it was a good story. But it took five years. And had he given up or listened to the twentieth no or the hundredth no, we wouldn't have had that movie. And you know it's worth it if you believe in something. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely, totally agree. So you know what have you found that helps you keep going when it gets tough? I mean, I'm sure you've had lots of rejection as well. You know, what do you do in the fifth day or fifth month or fifth year of having no after no after no hit you? How do you keep yourself going? It's really hard. I think it's difficult to be objective about your own work. You know, when we, when we finish a draft, we love it. We're laughing at it. We're loving our words. And we get to that point where we're not objective. But I think if, if other people are encouraging us, that helps us. If you're writing with a partner or if you have a good agent that's telling you that the work is great, well, the agent wouldn't represent you if they thought the work was not good, but know that your work is good and that is your biggest confidence. You know, I think the, the, the Marine Corps, not to bring up the subject of my book a hundred times, but I talk about this all the time. The, the Marine Corps was not the place that I was supposed to be. I'd never run a mile in my life, yet I learned that you use your brain to push one step further, to take one more step, to run that mile with a 70 pound pack. It's brain power. So motivate yourself and just drive forward. Rejection is really hard. I was an actor before and I still do stuff. I, I have a show uh, in development in front of the camera as well. And you hear a lot of no's right to your face. Those rejection letters that come, whether you're submitting your book or a newspaper article, uh, you know, they can be really personal. It's, it's nice if a rejection letter comes and says, you know, I love your voice, but this isn't right for us. That's good. But God, I think just the best thing that I've got going is, is, the, is the power of positive thought and belief that my projects are good. Mm, absolutely. Well, I mean, so you talk about the belief, you've talked about that a couple times. It's like the belief that your work is good, like knowing that your work is good. But, you know, you also mentioned like not everyone's going to be objective when they're giving you feedback, friends and family, maybe even your agent. Um, how do you know that your work is good or how do you prove to yourself that your work is good? 
it, the feedback that I get from others, you know, I, I have a couple of blogs and I blog for other people like Huffington Post and Goodman Project. So I get to hear public comments. I get to hear people that respond uh, or tell me something in person. There are people, I will, I'll admit it, I've run into, into writers that have been in the business a, a little too long without any success, whose work product I didn't feel was, was worth staying in the business for. Uh, that's not my journey. I'm not in their boots to to go forward with that. I don't know. I'm not going to say delusion, but just you know, it may not be the best. They may not be best suited for that. But I I've written for a long time, and I've had I've had a modicum of success. So that that keeps me keeps me going. Uh, believe me, I wish that that I'd never had a rejection. I I wish that people. I've always thought that my mother should be my agent. You know, she'd, she'd say, oh, you should read this guy. His stuff is amazing. His stuff is fantastic. But, you know, that wouldn't be fair. I want an agent that, that tells me, you're not on the right track with this. But they do represent you. They took you on for a reason. Um, I do believe that if, if, you're, if you're a writer and you're, you know, you're writing a book or you're writing a blog, definitely have a circle of friends that you respect there are you know book clubs and other people make sure that you're that you are surrounded with people whose opinions you respect mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely so i want to shift gears a little bit and talk about your book now the pink marine um and you also just mentioned you know surround yourself with with people you respect obviously in the marines i'm sure with a lot of guys that you really really respected that you worked with there um tell us about that journey what was it like you know, it, it's a, the book is funny and I, I meant it to be funny because it's, that's my voice. That's my experience, obviously in writing sitcoms. Uh, I joined by accident and you'll sort of hear when you read the book, how that happened. But I, I wasn't raised in a military family. I had no idea what I was doing in the Marines, but I did learn that in order to get the respect of others, you have to respect yourself. That goes back to believing that your work product is good. So when I was in the military, I learned to, to respect the people that I thought were smart and good and made clear decisions. I met a lot of bozos, and of course, I'm not going to follow those people into battle. You're, you're being trained in the military to act on command and to accomplish a mission. And so you have to believe in your leaders. And when it's turned around and you're that leader, you have to have the tools and the effectiveness to lead those men. And women into battle. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, every, you know everything's a mission, right? No matter no matter what we do. Right, totally. So and, why did why did you write the book? I mean, why did you want to get this message out there to people? Two reasons. I started writing the book a couple of years ago when all the stories of bullying were were being surfaced. I wanted people to to hear that if I can become a United States Marine, a sergeant in the United States Marines eventually, that anybody can do anything. I, I hated to hear the stories of, of young men and, and women who were bullied that let their bullies succeed and, and, and didn't, didn't push forward and live their own truth and their own journey. That's when I first started writing the book. And then as I was writing it, it sort of switched a bit to include the fact that I wanted to tell the stories of what it was like before being out was in you know i was in when being gay in the military was illegal and i wanted to write these stories to show people today who get to watch and thank god it's out there you know got to watch the the supreme court decision got to watch the defense of marriage act fall uh we have gay pride parades in most major cities and all major cities and a lot of small towns but there was a time when that wasn't cool so i wanted to chronicle the stories and remind people of what the civil rights journey for the LGBT was, especially in the military, but also just in my personal life. It chronicles the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. That's awesome. So, I mean, you mentioned, you know, you were bullied in the military or maybe even earlier in your life as well. How did that work out for you? I mean, how did you overcome that, especially in the military? When I was a kid, I was bullied. I was little and skinny, and that plays an important part in the book. I didn't pass the physical to get in the Marines. I had to lie and cheat to even get in. So that was a pretty funny story. But I was bullied as a kid because I was little, and also we moved around a lot. I was always the new kid. I went to 13 schools in 11 years, and so I had no self-confidence, yet I was constantly thrust in these new situations. So I always used humor to try to, you know, 
I laughed at myself first. I had my nickname was Cambodia legs and that killed me. It was like stabbing me when someone would say that or that was brought up, but I had to laugh too. I had really skinny legs. And technically it's funny when you look at it, you know, much later, but when you're a little kid and you're hearing that or you're being thrown up against the locker because I was the lowest hanging fruit, not to be funny, but you know, it was easy to pick on the little kid and and to deflect with humor and try to regain control of the situation or at least calm the, the terror of the situation by being a nice guy, a funny guy, everybody's friend. Uh, that was my best tool. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Awesome. I used that in the Marines too. I, I, I tried to, you know, I, I definitely, I think I was successful in achieving rank after rank after rank in the Marines because I was somebody that, that people did respect because I was honest. Mm -hmm. Honest about your own faults, you mean? Honest about my own faults. I think, you know, uh, I'm the first person to tell you that I messed up. I don't want to do it. Uh, you know, nobody wants to tell you that they made a huge mistake, but I cook now. And if, if you eat a dish and it's too salty, I'm busted. I messed up the salt. I'm going to own up to that. I'm not going to say, oh, your taste buds must be off. So, you know, you want to, you want to be responsible. And I definitely think that, that in order to respect someone, you have to really respect that person, their decision-making and their personal countenance. You know, you, you, you really need to see that in a person. I do. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And do you think this helped with your writing? I mean, but being willing to be honest about when you made mistakes and getting feedback from people and being willing to change your work. Definitely. You know, I took the first stab that I took at writing the pink Marine, uh, it was about 30 or 40 pages and I sent it to my, my most trusted friend and he read the pages and he said, why have you made some situations up and written in a voice that's not quite yours? And I realized that I was so fresh off the TV sitcom writing world that I was kind of writing my own memoir as a sitcom. So I put those pages away. I've never opened them again. And I started from scratch. Also, blogging helped me a great deal to find my voice because I was writing true adventure stories about my life. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah. So the next question I was going to ask you is, you know, how was writing the book different from you know your career as a screenwriter? You know, it was really interesting to write in long form in a in a sitcom in a script, whether it's a film or a television show. You have you have to use a really strict economy of words. You have to get the, the emotion across in a few words, the character descriptions, all of that. You know, it's very quick. You have to paint a room and paint a picture in, in like 10 words and get all those emotions across. But with a book, if I wanted to talk about how I felt about seeing a, a, a military base for the first time or what it felt to start to feel some confidence building, I got to I got to have 100 words, 200 words, 1,000 words. So it was really fun getting to use all, all the words. Right, totally. <laughs> it's, like, it's like you got all these words stuck in your head and you couldn't get it out quite when you're, you're a screenwriter because you got to get it so fast. But when you have more space, you can really you know, paint the picture much more elaborately. Yes. I yeah. appreciate it. And, and blogging helped me. You know, I went from sitcom writing. I started my first blog, Eat Greg Eat. And I was writing true stories and, and finding a lot of humor and, you know, self-deprecating humor and mistakes that I made. I, I, whether I was bungee jumping or traveling or, or cooking something or, you know, making a mistake, that really helped me when I started writing the book about a year after I started the blog. And then Huffington Post found me and they asked me to blog for them. And when they called me and asked if I wanted to contribute, I said, yeah, because I'm writing a book, I want to use you as part of my marketing platform. And they said, perfect, use us. That's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So when you, when you started that blog, I mean, was that just a hobby for you? Was that like a career move for you? What, what drove you to even start the blog in the first place? I wasn't writing a lot of television at that time. And so the, I missed writing and writing sitcom staffs have shrunk. It you, you just, Roseanne had 35 writers one season. She had to give them football jerseys with numbers on them. You know, number 27, what's a better word for pink? And so it, by the time it came around when I started the blog in about 2010, it, uh, I wasn't on staff. I was just writing freelance. And so I missed writing and I was looking to write. So I started taking pictures 
uh, started looking at pictures on my phone and writing stories about that. And then that triggered writing stories about my childhood or road trips. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And then I, at that spawned a travel uh, blog called Go Greg Go, where I write specific restaurant and hotel reviews. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So you're just writing, writing, writing all the time. It sounds like you've got a lot of work that you're working on right now. Well, I think, um, I'm sure this is a golden rule for you as well, which is a writer writes. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> and you mentioned, you know, earlier that, you know, you have the habit of writing every day. Is, do you still do that every day? I do. Uh, if I'm, if I'm just writing, if I'm not on a show or working on a script or shooting something, um, I write all day long. If I am working on something, like if I'm, if I'm taping a show or shooting something for Food Network, clearly that time is limited. I still have to write those scripts, by the way, and still have to write all the, the promotional stuff for that. But I get up really early. I try to stay kind of on, on an East Coast time, and I write every morning from either 5 or 6 in the morning till 10 when I would start that day. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So you're very, very disciplined about your writing. Social media is a huge time suck and you know, it's a double-edged sword. I use Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, Eat Greg Eat on all those places. Um, I keep on that one brand, Eat Greg Eat, but I was totally guilty and I go through periods where I'm, you know, I, I just, I mean, writing snarky things on Facebook or tweeting something that's not gonna drive my, my book or my blogs forward. And I have to remember to really limit that social media time. I try to put a 30 minute time cap on that either once or once in the morning or later in the day and really only use my energy to write things that are going to help myself and push myself forward. Mm -hmm, absolutely. So it sounds like your career's kind of shifted from, you know, more focused on the screenwriting to more focused on your own blogs and your own books. Uh, do you think, well, first of all, why did you make that choice? And the follow-up question is, you know, do you think a lot of writers are kind of following that same career path? That's a good question as far as what other writers are doing. I, I think that everybody's looking for, in this day and age, the way to get paid. That's, that's the toughest thing. You know, blogging opened up a lot of doors for me, yet at the same time, I'm creating content for free that five, 10 years ago, I would have been paid by word for. Then again, I'm getting to you know, tweet and, and, and send out my blog posts and things about my book to you know, God knows how many people every day. And it, it is, it's a double-edged sword, that, that, uh, that writing for free. I, you know, my progression also, I spend a lot of time working on television shows as well, but in front of the camera, like we talked about, that's all based on the book. Everything that's happened over the past two and a half years for me has been based on what I wanted the book to do. So the first television producer that called to ask if I wanted to cook on his television show, I said yes, because I wanted to use it as a platform for the book. As you know, and you examine a lot with all of your, your, your other guests and your listeners even, is how to get your book out there and how to get the message out there. And so but then when Food Network called and said, we love your blog so much, we think it might be a television show, I started saying, yes, I want it to be a television show because I want to be able to say that he's the guy that wrote that book, The Pink Marine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'm curious, like, is your blog like, so popular that that's why you're getting all these calls? Or is it, are you sharing the word of mouth through your community in Los Angeles as well? that, hey, you know, you write this blog and you've got this great content and maybe it'd be a good show idea? Or is this stuff just coming naturally to you because people are finding you online? Um, a, a combination of both. People do find me, Huffington Post found me, Mark Burnett found me to go on the show on the menu, but a producer that I know actually took my blog and sent it to Food Network and said, this is a TV show. And they were like, oh, we think it is a TV show. I'm on a show, Unique Sweets, for them right now. and. Uh, you know, my screen credit comes up uh, home cook and author. So I couldn't ask for anything better than that. And then, but I, I, I wish I had more time to blog. You know, I'm on book tour right now. So there's more activity on the pinkmarine.com right now than there is on eatgregeat.com. But I'm writing a piece um, today that'll go up on eatgregeat. I don't know if it'll, if it'll hit today though. Hmm, gotcha. So how do you, 
uh, work on your blog post? I mean, is it something like you write in half an hour and post it right away? Do you take a lot of time to review them? How do you approach that? Because you're writing for free, like you mentioned. Do you treat it the same way you would if you were writing a script for you know a, a big hit movie? How do you treat that process? I do. You know, I I love the blogger format because I can have several drafts going at the same time. Um, in my dream world, I would have 10 completely finished, edited, polished posts, and I could schedule and push them every couple of weeks and just keep creating new, but having that, that, that money in the bank amount of completed and polished blog posts. I'm not there right now because I'm obviously running around the country doing this book, but I, and thank God, but I, um, I have an idea and I park it. And then if I'm, uh, totally inspired. I just get it all out there. The piece I'm working on today is a little complicated. It's about a chef here in LA that came from France, one of my favorite chefs. And I'm hooking the story around um, the Syrian refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And so do you have editors and do you get feedback on each of your blog posts? I do. I'm really lucky I have. I have my other half is a fantastic editor and looks at, uh, at the content and makes sure that I've kind of, uh, you know, blogs smaller, as we know, shorter, shorter than a book. I try to keep them under 3,000 words. And so I wanna make sure that there's transitions and the story is concise. I, I, I use humor in my blogs. Again, that's my big thing is they're funny. And then photos, uh, I also get a lot of help. That, that same person helps me do all my photos. Mm -hmm. I don't have that skill. <laughs> yeah. So have you found that, you know, learning to write for the blog has helped you improve writing and other areas as well? Yes. And I'll tell you the other thing that helped me, uh, and it even helps me in the blog, is working with the copy editor on my book. Uh, Nicole Klungel was fantastic. I reached out, I believe starting at the top, when I was writing the book, I reached out to Jane Friedman. And she was really helpful with a lot of great advice. And she recommended that I use her copy editor. Nicole Klungel, and she, along our process of copy editing, you know, chapter by chapter, I was uh, I was learning from her. I don't have an MFA in writing. I'm a Marine, but and sitcom writer. That's not you know I'm, I'm no novelist. Uh, well, I guess I am now. But the uh, the the format of the blog helps me be be clear in a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Great. So, do you have any last words of advice that for other aspiring writers out there? Everybody's going to tell you to, to, that a writer writes. I want you just to believe in yourself and find your voice. You're going to hear that whether, you know, I went to the San Francisco Writers Conference last year, mind-blowing information that's given, and every single meeting had the same sort of message. Find your voice. Look, I told you I wrote those first 30 or 40 pages of my book. It wasn't the right voice. I found my voice through blogging. And now that's what I use. So my biggest advice is to find your voice and keep writing and authenticity, you'll find success. Awesome. That's so true. Yeah. Um, you know, cause I know it's be true, right? Like just be yourself. Don't hold it back. Just get, give it all on the, on the page and it'll, it'll shine through. Your voice will shine through. And write like nobody's going to read it. Look, there's a good chance nobody will. I don't know who reads my stuff. So go for it. Absolutely. Awesome, Greg, you shared uh, just some awesome information and a lot of humor with us today. I really appreciate it. Before you go, tell us where people can find out more about you, uh, your book, The Pink Marine, and what you're up to. Uh, on eatgregeat.com, that's my regular blog, and it, you can toggle to all my other blogs. And so eatgregeat.com on Twitter and Instagram, my Facebook page is a lot of fun. Uh, and then on my website for the book, thepinkmarine.com, you got to go to that. It's hilarious. I've roped in some of my... Hollywood actor friends to do little, you know, 30 second videos with me for the book. If you run into me at a party in LA right now, there's a good chance I'm going to corner you and make a video with my phone. <laughs> so awesome. Green, some fun stuff. That sounds like fun. I hope to see you at a party sometime. Come on. Well, I'll come see you. You've got the better location right now. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks, Greg. I appreciate you being here, man. Have an incredible day. You too. Thanks, Tom. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.